Hi, I'm Peggy Farron. Welcome to the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel, nature, and fine art photography. Today, we are going to talk about shooting waterfalls with Kevin Adams, but also, Kevin is kind of like the MacGyver of photography, so we're going to talk about some of his gadgets, so make sure you listen all the way through to the end when we get to the gadgets, because he's got some cool stuff. <laughs> Now, the Understand Photography Show is a podcast, but we also put behind the scenes on YouTube and on um, Facebook. We do a Facebook watch party on Fridays at 4 p.m. Eastern time, so you can watch with us, and that's kind of fun. Now, today we talk a lot about different, well, we don't go into detail, but we talk about Photoshop techniques, of course, shooting in the manual mode. Um, a little bit about Lightroom. So I just want to let you guys know that our motto at Understand Photography is we simplify the technical. So we have online courses. Um, one is called Photoshop Cram Course, which will kind of baby step you through Photoshop. One is called Getting getting started with Lightroom, which Joe Fitzpatrick put together. Now, And we have actually several software classes. But what's different about our software classes is they're just tiny little videos, but there are lots of them. So, for instance, actually, I'm more familiar with Joe's class because I've had to take it a few times because I'm a little slow when it comes to Lightroom. But he first walks us through how to set up Lightroom correctly so that you can find your pictures. That's a big problem we all have in, in Lightroom was we don't know where our pictures are. So he, he starts with a video on just making sure that you know how to import your pictures, how to put them in there correctly so that they'll be easy to find again. Then the next video might be on how to keyword and tag them. The next video might be on how to find the keywords and tags. I don't remember the order. I'm just guessing. But what's nice about that is you go through these videos sequentially but then when you forget how to do something, all you got to do is watch that three minute video or five minute video, however long it is, because you keep the class for life. With the Photoshop, today we talk a lot about layers. And of course, in the Photoshop cram course, we really simplify layers, layers and layer masks. So make sure that you look, check those out at understandphotography.com. Also at understandphotography.com, we'll have the show notes. So everything that we talk about um, today, Kevin and I, you'll, you'll, you'll have access to that with links. Now, Kevin Adams is, he's a North, he's North Carolinian. Is that how you say that? I don't even know. Anyway, he lives in North Carolina and he actually has written many books, but one of his books is Waterfalls of North Carolina. So there are a thousand waterfalls or something like that, I think he said. So it's a guidebook. So it helps you find them kind of tells you a little bit about the photography and things like that. So he's going to give us details about photographing waterfalls. We'll talk a little bit about long exposures, slow, you know, quick exposures, things like that. Photographing in the rain. Oh, it's really going to, it's a really fascinating talk. So stay tuned. So welcome, Kevin. Well, thank you for having me, Peggy. It's great to be here. Yeah, well, I'm so glad you are. So tell, tell our audience a little bit about you and your photographic journey. Well, let's see. Gosh, I've been photographing 35 years now. Ooh. Oh, goodness. Doesn't, doesn't seem possible, but I have. And I started out photographing waterfalls. Oh, first. my God. That was your first thing. That was my first thing. My um, first wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, gave me a camera for a birthday present. I have no idea why. I'd never mentioned wanting a camera or anything. And... Um, so for some reason, she did. I took the camera out and boy, I'm the kind of person that if I do anything, either I do it or I don't. So um, I took that camera out. I went up to the mountains. I started shooting waterfalls. And I guess as they say, the rest is history, huh? <laughs> now, where, where do you live? Well, right now I live um, in a little town called Waynesville, which is close to Asheville, North Carolina. Oh, so you uh, have a lot of waterfalls there? Oh yeah, I can be at a waterfall in 10 minutes from my house. Nice. Oh yeah. But then at the time when I first got the camera, I lived in the central part of the state in a town called High Point. So I had to drive a couple hours to get to the waterfalls, but I did it all the time. Wow, that's awesome. So so you were just doing this as a hobby, I assume, to start? Yes. 
Yes, although um, just a few years in, or maybe just a few months in, I knew that this is what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And so I worked at it towards that goal of making money at it. And one day I hope to actually start making money at it. <laughs> well, you know, we, goes, right? <laughs> yeah, well, I'll, I'll tell you something. I've seen your work and it's fabulous. And, and uh, we, we have a hands-on workshop that we do um, at least once a year called Selling Your Photography as Art. And I plan to hopefully get that online pretty quickly. So <laughs> keep that in mind. <laughs> anyway, so I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What? I need all the help I can get. Don't we all? <laughs> so what inspired you to write your first Waterfalls book? So uh, when I was a child, family vacations were usually to the mountains when we did go on vacation. And it was always to see the waterfalls because my mother loved waterfalls. Aww. And at the time, there was nothing out there, no information about the waterfalls. So my family talked about it. My mother and my older brothers talked about writing a book. They never wrote the book, but I took up the mantle and did it myself. Wow. And, and you had, of course, beautiful pictures to put in there. Well, when, it, when you go out and shoot as much as I do, you're bound to get a few every once in a while, right? Now, do you feel like that helped your writing the book, helped your photographic skills? Oh, not just, not only my photographic skills, but all kinds of skills. Like what? Writing skills, research skills uh, on how to find the waterfalls and learning about you know, hiking skills, reading maps and just all kinds of things, uh, dealing with people, asking questions, interviews and things like that. But certainly the photography aspect of it. Um, now what, what's the name of your first book? Uh, it's North Carolina waterfalls and it's, it's, on, it's in its third edition now and the title's the same, Wow! but I've done, um, nine books total. Uh, including a couple of waterfall books. I did one on the waterfalls of Virginia and West Virginia that's now out of print. Um, but the North Carolina waterfalls book has stayed, the title stayed the same through all three, three editions. Oh, that's awesome. All right. So let's, let's talk about the photography aspect. So what is your favorite method in photography for capturing waterfalls? Oh gosh. Um, or do you go all over the place, like well, long exposure, I, short exposures, whatever? I do. I go all over the place. But I do have, um, yeah, I guess that's really hard to answer because it depends on, on the waterfall. Okay. Uh, on, on how I would, would do that. Um, you hear a lot about the shutter speeds. And it, you, there seems to be two different camps. There's the camp that hates the silky water look. And then there's the camp that, that loves it. Um, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of in between. Well, I'm in between. Uh -huh. I, I, I tend to be different about a lot of things, but um, so I pick how I approach that based on the waterfall itself. If it's a, a large, powerful waterfall and in particularly a free flowing waterfall that has a lot of water, in other words, it's just a curtain of water coming down. Then you don't want to do the silky look with that because it ends up just being a white sheet. So you mean like something that's really wide? Yeah, like Niagara Falls, for instance. Okay. If it's just, if it's just a wide sheet of water just free-flowing coming down and you try to do a long exposure, you think, oh, I'm going to do the silky look. No, you're not. You're going to photograph a sheet. It's uh -huh. just like hanging a white sheet up there. That's all it's going to be, and it's going to be overexposed on top of that. So, no, a fast shutter speed works good then. Try to sort of freeze, for me to freeze the water and maybe see a few of the droplets and things. But then when you've got a more of a, a dainty waterfall or a, a creek, it's flowing through the forest, you know, over rocks and ripples and stuff like that. And I love the silky look on that. And while we're talking about that, let me just throw this in. Um, there's no real here, no reality. So I hear this all the time. People that don't like the silky look, they, they say, well, I like my waterfalls to look real. There is no real here. We don't see, we, we're, we see in video. We don't see in steels with our eyes. So, so take your pick, one or the other, either 
frozen or silky look. Neither one is real as, as actually from what we see with our eyes. So uh, That is such a good point. I never thought of looking at it that way. But can't you kind of do an in-between, like a kind of slow shutter speed? Would that look okay or no? Because, well, now, from the standpoint of looking okay, what looks okay is what you like. So oh, good point. You like the way it looks, then it's okay. So <laughs> now from the standpoint of trying to approximate what we see with our eyes, from what I hear, shutter speeds in the 150th, 160th, 180th range, depending on the water, how much, how fast, you know, big the waterfall is, tends to approximate what we see. And, and I think that's the case. So if, if you really want to try to do that, just 160th of a second, but good luck finding the waterfall in the conditions that's going to let you be hamstrung by having to pick that particular shutter speed. <laughs> so it sounds like the best idea if you're new at it is to try it all. Oh yeah. Yeah. Best idea is just shoot it the way you want to make it look the way you want to. Now, do you use um, neutral density filters to, you know, so that you can do a long exposure? No, no, no. I, I, I never. Have never. You, that surprises you, me. Not, not to get the long exposures. I don't need to. Let me explain that because okay. So a neutral density filter, its only purpose is to increase the exposure. Right. Mm-hmm. To darken the lens, right? You know, it, to, to increase the shutter speed, I should have said, not the exposure, but, but to lengthen the shutter speed. Correct. Okay. So, um, the waterfalls that I shoot and the way that I like to shoot waterfalls I can get those slow shutter speeds to give that silky look without having to put a filter on there. So if I like to shoot on overcast days when the light is less, I like to use low ISOs for the best image quality. Um, and I need to stop the lens down, the aperture down to get enough depth of field. Um, so at least F eight or 11 or so. And generally speaking, that means that I'm going to have shutter speeds that are slow enough to give me the silky look. Now, if I'm shooting out in the open, if it's a sunny day, then yes, it is possible that I wouldn't get that, that I'm going to have those faster shutter speeds. But anytime in my photography, when I'm shooting waterfalls in those conditions, it's not a small little dainty waterfall. It's a, it's a large, big, more of a powerful type waterfall that I want to use the faster shutter speeds with anyway, or the faster shutter speeds work okay with it. So I've never in 35 years used a neutral density filter to increase the shutter speed to give the silky look. The reason I say it like that is because I do use the neutral density filters to increase the shutter speed in another instance when photographing waterfalls. And that's when you've got the little whirlpools that everybody loves to shoot, you know, and you've got leaves in the whirlpools. And by the way, for those leaves in the whirlpools, I found that at least here in the Southern Appalachians where I shoot, you got a lot of trees that grow around the pools and stuff. So if you're really careless when you set up to get the shot and like bump up against the trees, you know, and maybe accidentally grab one and shake it, then a lot of the more leaves will fall in the, the pool there for you. So <laughs> that, seems to have, that seems to happen with me a lot. I mean, I'll get there and there's no leaves at all in that little whirlpool. I'm thinking, but all of a sudden after I've set up, wow, look, there's a lot of leaves in there. I must have <laughs> against the tree. Anyway. Okay. So sometimes you need, when you're shooting those whirlpools, you need the really slow shutter speeds, like a minute, two minutes or so to really get those swirls. So sometimes I will use a neutral density filter for that. But generally, even for that, I would just use multiple exposures because you can do that, you know, in post-process and just shoot several exposures to get the full effect. And then you can stack those later in Photoshop. All right, and I actually have a little training video on how to do that, but on, on oh, yeah. understandphotography.com, but why don't you explain that? Because that is really cool that to do that. When Chris Hopkins taught me how to do that, who takes me hiking in the Everglades, uh-huh. I was so excited. So, so explain <laughs> how to do that. Well, you just, it, it's actually very simple. You just shoot however many exposures you want to, and then just blend them. Now, I use Photoshop. I don't use Lightroom. All right, but, 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 but. wait, back yeah. up. Okay, okay back let's, up. let's baby step this. Tripod, let's go step by step. Okay, always tripod I mean, for everything, not just shooting whirlpools, 
Um, so always use a tripod. So just get your composition composition set up the way you want it. Um, figure out the exposure. You want to, the idea is to have as long a shutter speed as possible. So use the lowest ISO. So whatever, one, in most cases, that'll be 100. ISO for your, for your camera is. Some of them are 64, you know, some 80, some 100, whatever. Just choose that. Um, stop the lens down, 16 or 22. That's going to give you the longest shutter speed. So you're, And you may be okay with that. Depending on the lighting conditions that you're shooting in, you may already be fine with that and not need to shoot. And also depending on how fast the whirlpool's going on. But if you can't get the swirl looking exactly the way that you want to with that, then just shoot multiple exposures. Shoot one, then another, then another. You want to have as short a shutter speed or a short a time between the exposures as possible. So just as soon as one's over, click another. Let it go. If you've got a locking shutter release, which I like to use, I, I still use the wired releases and it's got a lock on it. So I just put it on continuous and lock it down and shoot four or five exposures and there you go. Then when you get back at the computer, the way that I do it is just, I bring up the files and say, I don't use Lightroom and I'm not sure that you, I don't know that much about Lightroom. I don't think you can work with layers in Lightroom. Um, I, I don't think you can do it in Lightroom. Yeah, so I just open them up in, in um, Photoshop and just blend the images together in Photoshop. Yeah. And you know what, audience, I will put a link to my video on because I, I did a whole video. I mean, it's like five, it's not even five minutes, I don't think, on how to do it. <clears throat> so I'll put that in the show notes at understandphotography.com. So just look for Kevin Adams show and uh, the, the link will be cool. right in there. Cool. I promise you, folks, it's easy. It's a piece of cake. All right. So what about a polarizer filter? Do you ever use that to reduce glare? All the time. Um, I have I have my little rule that if I'm photographing during the daytime, there's a polarizing filter on my lens, unless I can verbalize a reason to take it off. And most of the time, I can't. If I'm outside shooting, that polarizer is it's on the lens. Okay, and you know what? That's going to darken the lens somewhat right there. So you it can. Does. Yeah, mine about a stop, maybe stop and a half, something like that. If it's a full polarization. Now, if people are not familiar with a polarizing lens, which is also called a CPL, um, what exactly, how does that help you with waterfalls? And so, how do you use it? So the, the polarizing filter helps with everything outside. Uh, but in specifically with waterfalls, it will, it will saturate the foliage. It makes those greens just pop. It reduces the glare, so it takes the glare off of the water, the surfaces, the rocks, so that they're not hot spotting as much. Um, and we have here, like in the southern Appalachians, a lot of rhododendron leaves, and they will just hot spot like crazy with the glare, the sunlight, or any light coming off of them. So that polarizing filter will remove all of that. People talk about using it to... Um, to darken a sky, to blow up a sky and make the clouds pop. So you, you don't use that as much for waterfalls, although sometimes you would. Um, but um, yeah, it just, the saturation, the way it just really saturates. And let me tell you something, I don't care what anybody says, there is no polarizing filter in Photoshop. Go try to find it. It's not there. <laughs> it's not. If, if it was possible to, to duplicate that effect in Photoshop, don't you think Adobe would have put it in there by now? You can't do it. So you need that polarizing filter and put it on your lens. If you've never used one before, you might not realize you have to rotate the filter. So you put it on and then you just, as you're looking through the camera, you're looking at the back of the camera, you rotate the filter. And in some circumstances, you'll see a huge change. Now, in others, it might be subtle. You have to really look for it. But I promise you, it's going to help you with just about every waterfall shot you make. Well, I would imagine one of the biggest problems with shooting waterfalls is the glare because water is very reflective. Right, right. Yeah, it, it can be a huge problem. Now, sometimes you want a little bit. And that's a good thing, though, with the polarizing filter, because you can look, you can see the effect as you rotate it. So maybe you don't go full polarization. Maybe you like looking, you know, seeing some of that, that glare coming off to add a little bit of emphasis in one area of the scene or something like that. And when you say you don't go 
full polarization, you mean you just turn the lens? Just turn the filter as you're looking through the lens or looking at the back of the camera and until it gets the effect that you desire. And you can see as it, as you're turning it, okay, it's getting more and more and more and more. And then it goes back to less, 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 and less. So you can see that point where it's maximum polarization. So sometimes it's best just to back off from that a bit. Okay. All right. What about composition? Do you have any tips on composing images with waterfalls? And uh, I'm sure it depends on the waterfall. It does. It does. I guess the, the, the first thing that I would say about composition is, boy, don't, don't try to figure it out by just looking at the waterfall. You, you, you can't do it. Um, I see this all the time. So you hike up to a waterfall, you come up to the edge and you're trying to guess, okay, you know, I wonder how it's going to look on the other side over there, maybe a profile shot. So you're trying to judge that photo by standing here, the photo that you're going to shoot over there by standing here, that doesn't work. You need to go take your body and your camera to that spot and look at the shot. If you use live view, just hold a look at it. See, I'm a, I'm a, a viewfinder guy. So I put it up to my eye and I look at it and see what it looks. It's the only way that you're going to really truly judge what that shot looks, looks like. So see a lot of people will go up and then they'll, they'll take that one shot right there and then they'll look around, you know, nah. Now, nah. so go all around the waterfall. If okay. It, There's no just standing in one spot thinking, oh, that looks a, like a good spot. You actually have to go to each spot. Now, are there good spots to, I'm sorry. You'll miss shots if you do that. Yeah. Are there particular, like, should you be at the bottom of the waterfall, halfway in the between? I mean, can you give us some guidance? Yeah. And that's, of course, that's going to depend on the, the waterfall itself. So I have uh, this other little rule of mine that I call the seven point rule of composition. And that says that there are seven potential vantage points for any subject, any subject. There's right and left, there's front and back, there's above and below, and there's inside out. So uh, I never thought of that. If you like to photograph, um, historical structures or cabins or something like that. So the inside out will be get inside and shoot out a window kind of thing for a waterfall. A lot of waterfalls you can get behind, can't you? Yeah. You through the spray. So I love to do that. Um, but remember the idea is you have to physically go to each of these locations to check out the shot if it's safe to do so. And and, and if you're able to do so, a lot of waterfalls, you can't do it. A lot of waterfalls, that's it. You're stuck with where you, where the trail ends up right there. But if you can, and it's safe, check out all the vantage points. Okay. But you, you didn't really tell me, should I be at the bottom of the waterfall? Um, or you, the middle? Do you I want mean, to? is there, how would I do the middle anyway? Um, I don't know. If you figure that out, let me know. Cause I can think of a few waterfalls I can make great shots from if I can I guess, get there. Yeah. Uh, I guess, you know, a, prof a profile view, maybe if you climb up the bank, which I, I do that sometimes too. But no, as far as where you should be is just wherever you want to be to make the photo that you want to. There's no right or wrong on that. Just check out all the vantage points and, and shoot the photo the way that you want it to look. Um, I tend to like, profile views. So I like to get at the side of the waterfall and, and look at them. I think to me, they're just more compelling than directly in front. Okay. Um, so I like to do that. And I don't like to, if I'm at the base of the waterfall, I'm real careful about tilting up a wide angle lens because that gives it, you get perspective distortion like that. You know, it makes the waterfall look like it's falling over backwards. You can fix some of that in, in post-processing, but you can't really make it work well when you do that. So try to keep that camera as straight on as, as possible. So you're going to back up as far as you can. Well, you back up as far as you can. And an, another trick that I use is I'll use the widest lens that I have and include a lot of foreground that I'll plan to crop out later. So instead of tilting it up, I keep that straight and I get the top of the composition the way that I want it. And I don't even pay attention to all the 
stuff that's at the bottom that I don't want there. And then I can come back and crop it out later. Okay. Bye. that That's really but good advice. Cause camera straight. I'm so sorry. I was talking. And so that means neither one of us are, we're going to come out. What did you just say? Um, oh, um, I crop out the bottom later. Okay. But I keep it straight and then crop out the bottom later so that I don't get that perspective distortion. Okay. Yeah. That, that is really good advice because you know, people say, well, why do I have to have all these lenses? Well, there's one good reason because you don't want to have that distortion of tilting up. And in most cases, I would imagine you can't back up very far because you're in a wooded area or something like that. Yeah. With waterfalls, got to be careful. Hey, think about all these people that are doing these selfies, standing at the edges of cliffs and things like that. And then they back up and, you know, we hear about it on the news. Oh, I didn't think of that. I didn't think of that reason. I was just thinking because of the trees would be in the way. Yeah, trees and drop offs. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> well, so now you you just told us that you crop out the bottom if you you know if you get too much foreground in there. Do you have any other suggestions for getting rid of visual cl- clutter? Because I would imagine you're in wooded areas most of the time. Yes. Yes. Uh, And um, I spend a lot of time on that because I'm a, I'm a clutter freak. I I just don't like it at all. Some people, it doesn't bother them. They think it's it's natural, you know, so they leave it in there. Not me. Uh -uh. No, I have literally spent hours cleaning up waterfalls. And you're talking about in Photoshop? No, 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 no. I'm talking about on site. Now I do, I do clean up in Photoshop. I'll talk about that, but on site. So come up to a waterfall, it's covered in fallen branches and trees and all that kind of stuff. And maybe there's a few beer cans over there. Well, I guess it goes without saying that I'm getting rid of those beer cans, right? Now, I won't swim across a pool in February to remove a beer can. No, that's coming out in Photoshop. But all the limbs and stuff and all that, yeah, I'll go ahead. I'll get the composition set up the way that I want it. And then I'll go and take out all the clutter that's there, that's in that composition that I can't. I carry a camp saw, a little folding camp saw with me and to help me saw off the branches and the fallen trees and the things like that to remove them. You could do it in Photoshop using the healing brush, the clone stamp and stuff. And I do that if I have to, but... Boy, when you've got a waterfall, it's just it's hard to do. And I'm not a not a Photoshop guru, so I can't. You got you want that water to look right, and you've got a whole tree with branches coming over. No, it, it's that's hard to do for me to do. So I spend a lot of time in the field. So how long? Do you, I mean, how far away do you have to drag those branches? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can see I don't have very strong don't have big muscles here, so I can't throw them too far out of there. So I do have to drag them for (laughs) just to get them out of the frame, you know? And one thing, let me mention this. I'm very careful about uh, not disturbing the critters. So if it's a, if it's a tree that's been there a while and it's got moss on it and it's got critters living in it and stuff like that, it just stays put. I don't, I don't move that out of the way. And if I've got to drag a tree across a sensitive habitat or something, then I just ignore it. Uh, you might just, reposition it just to kind of get it so it looks I, better in the shot or something. Yeah, or just not even take the photo. Just walk away and say, yeah. Yeah, because I know a lot of people are very sensitive about you should leave it exactly how you found it. But I don't know, it's just moving a dead branch out of the way a bad thing. It doesn't seem like it to me. I can't think of a reason it would be. Not, it's not a bad thing to me. Well, they leave the beer can there. I'd have to ask them that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you walk, walk up and there's um, five beer cans right at the edge of the pool. Are they going to compose the scene to include those beer cans? Probably not. They're probably going to tilt the lens up or can go in tighter. So the beer cans aren't there. Well, if I want to make my shot, to include the edge of the pool because I think it helps the composition. 
but it's also going to have those beer cans there. Are they suggesting that I should leave those beer cans there? Yeah. I mean, they got rid of them by just zooming in tighter, but I want, I want a wider view. So yeah, I'm going to go up and move those beer cans. Sure. Well, you just brought up another question. I mean, is it, you know, is your style, I guess, because there's no better or worse to do the entire waterfall from, you know, top to bottom? That's, that's a good question. Um, and yeah, it's all subjective. So just whatever you want to do. I tend to either want to include all of the waterfall so that you see both the top and the bottom or just a small section of the waterfall. If I see the top but not the bottom or the bottom and not the top in a photo, it's jarring to me. And it, I want to see the rest. I look at the photo and I say, well, what does the top look like? Where's the top kind of thing? But just an isolation shot, which I love to do that type of shot, just zooming out sections of the waterfall. Well, yeah, that's, I don't have, I love doing that. <laughs> yeah. So, so what if you decide to do that wide shot where you're getting the top and the bottom? Huh? How much of the sky do you leave in? It, that depends. If, if it's an overcast day, I try not to have any sky in there because you've got a white sky and a white waterfall and your eye, that just, that doesn't work, especially if the two connect, if there's no vegetation between the two, then that's very jarring to me. Just, but just the fact of having that white overcast sky in there because your eye in images is drawn to the light areas of the image. I don't want people looking up at the sky when I'm looking at my waterfall that's in there. So don't want to have anything that's going to distract away from the main subject. So I try not to include an overcast sky. If it's, if it's a sunny day and I'm shooting out in the open, which I would be, I wouldn't be in the forest on a sunny day and I've got a blue sky or the clouds. Well, you just take it case by case, just however much I need to include to enhance the waterfall. Okay. Do you bracket? Cause wouldn't the sky be brighter? Yeah. Yeah. I, I bracket for two reasons. Um, even though we have digital cameras now and you can get the exposure just right. You don't have to guess and I don't have to shoot four rolls of film bracketing just to make sure I come back with the one that's, that's just right. Um, I still, once I've gotten the exposure that I think is the right exposure, I will still shoot a couple, like a third and two third stops in both directions, just because back at the computer, depending on certain subjects that you're shooting, certain lighting conditions, I may decide I want to process one of those others rather than that middle one. But I think you're asking bracketing about lighting differences in the scene. That's, a, that's another very important thing. And oh my gosh, yes. Because you can have, you got a white waterfall and the surroundings, the moss and the rocks and stuff, very dark, or you've got the sky situation that you're talking about. So I do a tremendous amount of bracketing in those cases. And oftentimes I'll have to use different parts of the scene where let's say I get an exposure that's right for the waterfall then I get another exposure that's right for the surroundings. Then I'll take those two, I'll put them together. I do a lot of work with masks and stuff in, in, in the layers in Photoshop. And I'll put, stack those two together and then just mask out the bad part of one so that I've got the best of both worlds. Now, why don't you use the HDR um, tool or whatever it's called in, the in camera. Photoshop? No, in Photoshop. Oh, I, we don't need to. I don't need to. If you're just talking about like a difference between the waterfall and the surroundings, let's say, well, I can, I can do a much better job. I can to somebody else. Maybe they can do better with the HDR, but I find that difficult to get that to look exactly right. Um, especially with the waterfalls because the sh the two shots are not the same because the water's moving. So I always have to go back and do a lot of cleanup there with it. But, I don't even need to go through that because I can just, just using those two images, I stack the two together and then just go over and pick a brush, working on a mask, pick a brush. And then I brush out the bad part, either the, the rocks that are the surrounding that's too dark or the water that's too white, depending on how the layers are stacked. 
Okay. And so I just wanted to, to just, in case our audience doesn't, you know, a lot of our audience just uses Lightroom. So if you're right. not familiar with, with Photoshop, masking is pretty, you know, you just need a couple of layers and a layer mask and it's really easy to use. We, we do, I'm not sure if we have a free video, but that is certainly um, in our getting started with Photoshop class or Photoshop cram, cram course, I think it's called online at, uh, right. at understandphotography.com. But it is pretty simple to do and it does look more realistic than the HDR part of either Lightroom or Photoshop. Yeah, especially, especially with waterfalls. That's been my experience that can make it look. So I would encourage everyone to, to go check out that information that you have because it is easy. People get, you know, when they hear layers, Photoshop and layers, then they, they just clam up. But I promise you, it's you, it, somebody that doesn't understand could sit down beside someone who does at their computer and they will be amazed because in two minutes, like you could just show them right there. And then they're like, Oh, wow. I didn't know I could do that. Yeah, you can do that. <laughs> and what's funny to me, of course, now I started with Photoshop because there was no such thing as Lightroom. And uh, I thought Photoshop, I think it's a lot easier to learn than Lightroom. And a lot of people, you know, they take the time to learn Lightroom. So believe me, Photoshop is not as hard. The, the thing that's different about Photoshop is you can make all the mistakes you want and you can learn tiny little bits at a time. You can just learn layers. You don't have to learn yeah. a whole pro program like you do with Lightroom. Because if you, if you import your pictures wrong in Lightroom, man, you can't find them again. <laughs> <laughs> I have to admit that's, that's part of the reason that I don't use Lightroom is I just don't want to invest in the learning curve to, to get started with it to do. And because I do so much work in layers, uh, I do a fair amount with the waterfalls, but um, my, I do a lot of night photography lot of night photography and and most of the night photography that I do involves working with layers and so Lightroom wouldn't help me with that I, so there's no huge advantage um, with it some of the cataloging aspects of it I think would be nice but like you say gosh how long have you know the way it's that definitely I definitely a learning curve. I got so lucky when I met Joe Fitzpatrick who works here because he uh, is the Lightroom guru of this area if not of Florida. He's just amazing. And he put together some classes that really, really simplify it. If you just, but you have to do the whole class. It's not like you can just skip around you like you can. Into time into it. Yeah. Yeah. So now what is the benefit? One of the things you told us is that you return to the same spot over and over again. What, what's yeah. the benefit of that? I'm, I'm, I'm just like that movie groundhog day. Just gosh. Yeah. Well, um, Benefit from the standpoint of seasons is the most obvious thing. So you can get the shot in spring, summer, fall, winter with the snow and stuff. But you know, a waterfall can change from day to day. Um, just like how so? Just with just weather changes, and it changes throughout the day. So the look of a waterfall that you shoot, uh, let's say on a sunny day, you're in the forest, so you go photograph it early in the morning before the sun gets high enough to, to hit the waterfall and create all kinds of contrast problems. So you go first thing, well, that light has a certain quality to it. And it's not, in my opinion, it's not necessarily the, the best light you want to be shooting in, but it's much better than the contrasty light if you waited another hour. Well, if you go back to that same waterfall the next day when it's cloudy, even if you go the same time of day, the lighting is going to be a lot different. It's going to look different. And in my opinion, it's going to be a better kind of lighting. Then if you go tomorrow, the next day, and it's raining, then boy, now you really got something. I mean, I just love photographing waterfalls on rainy days. Um, but why is that? Well, so a rainy day, you've got all that moisture in there. So you've got a gazillion, billion, trillion water droplets. How many is that? A gazillion billion trillion, <laughs> and and sometimes you you can add another uh, Googleplex to it. Um, all these water droplets, okay, and each one of those water droplets is a diffuser and a reflector, so it bounces that light everywhere. So 
basically it softens the light. You don't have that contrast. Every nook and cranny, so you don't have to worry about all oh, this waterfall so white and these this moss over here is so dark. No, you get nice, soft, even lighting. And the water from the rain, it hits that moss, it hits those leaves, it hits the rocks, and it, and it softens that out. So the rocks don't hotspot. They don't show up too white in the scene. And the, the moss and the leaves and the vegetation and everything is just so saturated with all that. Oh, boy, don't get me started. Rainy days. Great time mm -hmm. to photograph. Yeah. I never would have thought of that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. You, you have to remember where I live. <laughs> I live so, in, there are no waterfalls here. Yeah, Actually, that's not completely yeah. true because we do have some like fake waterfalls in front of communities. <laughs> that are purple and blue. Yeah. So, hey, try it just when you, if you're photographing in the forest and stuff, try going out on the rainy day right after a thunderstorm. I know you get a lot of thunderstorms down there where the leaves are still covered in the moisture and stuff and you get that nice saturation. So my motto is have enough sense to get out in the rain. Oh, I love that. Um, oh man, I just had a question. Oh, I know what it was. Okay. So you said that you do a lot of night photography. Do you do waterfalls yeah. at night? I do. And I love shooting waterfalls at night. In fact, I'm working on a book about photographing waterfalls at night. Oh my gosh. Um, that is, so what do you want to know about that? Because we could spend the whole hour just talking about that. And we don't have it's that just, much just, time. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it, it's great. So the cliff notes version, um, get a flashlight and go out. Ideally, Try to maybe go out when it's light enough to see because there is a is a danger issue, safety issue that we're talking about here. Um, but do everything basically like you would during the day, but illuminate the waterfall with the flashlight. Just take that flashlight and shine it at it and move it up and down. Play around with the settings, okay? Don't worry about, oh, I don't know what to do. Just do something. And then look at the image on the cameras. Oh, that's way too bright. Okay, well, you painted too much. Or your aperture, stop your aperture down. Go to 11 instead of 2.8 or something like that. So work all that out just like you'd work out exposure during the day. But the, the idea is that you're painting that, well, light painting, painting that waterfall with the flashlight. Do and you, you, can, you can include the sky too. So you can get the Milky Way, the stars or star trails and all of that stuff in there as well. Cool. Now, do you do you have a flashlight that you recommend or does it even matter? Do you just bring any flashlight or super strong one? Any, any, you don't need a really strong flashlight. Um, for one thing, the water is white, so it's reflecting a lot of that light. And even if you're a good distance away and by good distance, I mean several hundred feet away, most any flashlight will work. So if it's very dim, then you might have to paint a little longer, but most flashlights that I found work work very well for it. Yeah. And I'm going to include somewhere in the, in the show notes links to shows that we've had on, 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 on light painting uh -huh. so that we go, cause we go into detail on some shows. It's and a people, lot of fun. Yeah. yeah it's a I lot never of fun. thought about, yeah. So you include this. I can't wait to get that book comes out. Well, um, hopefully you'll have it by Christmas Ooh. This, of this year. Yeah. That's the plan. Um, good, good. All right. So, so can you give us a summary of, of, of tips? Ah, okay. So um, keep returning to the waterfalls as often as you can. Um, make notes when you're there to know when to return. So you get there and you say, okay, well, gosh, there's a lot of contrast here and I'm here on a sunny day. So make a note that that's one that you definitely need to return to on an overcast day. Um, so that kind of thing. Try out all the different compositions of the waterfalls. Use a polarizing filter. Use a tripod. And don't let anybody tell you what's right or wrong. This is all subjective here. So you make the photos the way that you want them to look. Just because I say that I want to see the top and the bottom of the waterfall or a really tight shot doesn't mean that that's the way to do it. You do it the way you want to. Those are great tips. Great tips. Um, all right. So tell us um, how to find your books first. Um, 
actually, you can find everything about me, especially my books, just by going to my website. It's kadamsphoto.com. So K the letter K, my last name, the word photo.com. Kadamsphoto.com. Yep. And, and what are the name of, how many books do you have? Well, I've written and photographed nine books, but they're, most of them are out of print now. Uh, so I only have like three or four maybe that are, that are still in print. But everything I have is on the website. Just click on store and gosh, you'll find all kinds of cool goodies. Now on the, the North Carolina waterfalls, if somebody's in North Carolina, that's the book to buy to find where they are? Right. Well, actually, that's its main purpose. It's a, it's a guide to finding the waterfalls and information about the waterfalls. I do give some information for photographers uh, in there. A photo, they have photo ratings, all of them. And I talk about some of the, the approaches to photography for some of the waterfalls. But it's really a guidebook to okay. on how to find the waterfalls. It's got a thousand waterfalls in it. 300 full listings, 300 photos. Are in wow. it. Yeah, it's, it was a lot of work. I can't, I can't even imagine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. One more thing, because you've designed some gadgets to make your life, your photography easier. So tell us about the gadgets and then we're going to wrap. We're going to say goodbye. Okay. So, well, they call me the MacGyver of photography because I'm, I'm always tinkering around and I've never met a piece of photo gear that I didn't think that I could improve. So the first thing that happens, it goes in my shop, even camera bodies, it goes in my shop and I'm tinkering around with it, trying to improve it. I had a need for a way to hold an umbrella over my camera when I'm shooting in the rain because I do so much of it, but it had to attach it almost instantly. I don't want to be messing around in, in the rain and fuddling with something. And I have to be able to remove the umbrella from the holder very quickly and handhold it during the exposure so that it didn't get the vibrations from the rain and the wind moving the, the tripod. Nothing like that was available and it's still not available. So I made something. I just made it in my shop. And for years I tried to figure out how I could sell it, but I couldn't find the parts at a cheap enough price to make it work. Well, a few years ago, you know, with the beauty of Amazon and you can find anything in the world, I found a few of the components that I really needed to make this guy work. So now I manufacture, I actually build it in my shop. I buy the parts, I put it together, I cut the aluminum tubes, sand it, file it, all of it. And, and I sell it. It's called the rain break and it works wonderful. It just very quickly clamps onto the tripod leg. And so you're, you're protected from the rain while you're composing and getting the exposure. When you're ready to shoot, you just instantly, remove the umbrella and hold it, click, put it back. Oh my God. I need, really I need one of those. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then what about your other gadget that helps your lens? Well, you tell us. Um, you're probably talking about the lens muff. Yes. 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 That was the first thing that I did. It's, um, it's like a little, little wallet basically that holds the little chemical hand warmers and you wrap it around your lens, it attaches with Velcro. And so it prevents your lens from forming dew and frost in the winter when you're doing the night photography. So it works very good. They make, actually, you can buy heater strips that work on 12 volt power for that. A lot of the astrophotographers use that and that's what I used for years. Then I started using the hand warmers and I put them in an old sock and wrapped it around the lens and that just, really didn't look good at all. My lens, they all hated me because I'm wrapping a sock around them. So who oh, hated, who hated you, your lens? My lenses, they're very <laughs> bad. Yeah, they couldn't stand that. So, <laughs> so I designed this, this more elegant solution to hold these hand warmer. And, um, and plus it's uh, much better than what I used to do, which is drag around an old big 12 volt battery to power the heater strips. So, <clears throat> wow. Any, any other gadgets in the works? So in the works, well, and I've got a couple of others that, that I've, I've got oh. one that's called the light clip, which holds the flashlight in place. It clamps onto your tripod leg and then it holds the flashlight so you can aim it. And that way 
you can compose. It's just a holder for the flashlight so that you can compose the shot at night. Um, you can also use it for light painting, for close-up photography. It works really good. And also to get focus at night. So you just point it at the waterfall, and then you can point your camera at the waterfall to focus to get your focus set. It's really hard to do with your hands uh, for that. Right oh now, I'm, I've I got... Am I, I'm just going to be shopping at your store, but keep going. <laughs> so in development now, just haven't had time to get it. It's it's just about ready to go. Just haven't had time to put it out there. Um, pod strap. It's a it's a shoulder strap or a cross shoulder strap that you that attaches to the clamp, the Arca Swiss style dovetail clamp on your ball head on your tripod so that you can carry your tripod on your shoulder, but instantly remove it, as opposed to all of the other systems that have two contact points on your tripod, and they take a while to you know disassemble and to put in there, and also that make the tripod stick out very far from behind, um, so you're banging up against people and things. I, I, it's mainly for um, street photography, and in, in cities and things, so it lets the tripod hang straight down. You loosen the ball head so that it'll swing, so it'll pivot as you walk, and it follows your motion as you walk. Okay, that one I'm not quite understanding, but when you get it, when you get it finished, just send me a note, and I'll send it I'll out. Maybe that. I'll just add it to these show notes. I would, I would do that. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. All right, so kadamsphoto.com. That's me. Thank you, Kevin, for being on the show, and thank you for being so patient because we had a few little technical things to get <laughs> to finally get this to work. <laughs> oh, Peggy, thank you for having me. This has been great. It's been fun. I, I'm very excited to meet you, so I, I definitely want hey. to uh, to see what we can do together, possibly. Come up, come up to Asheville, and uh, we'll go out and photograph some waterfalls in the rain. My God, I would love that. But you know <laughs> what? Does it rain in the summer? Because I don't like to be cold. <laughs> <laughs> it does rain in the summer. Yes. Okay, then I'm there. <laughs> All right, thank you for being on the Understand Photography Show. It's been great. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kevin. That was so interesting. I am, I'm like so excited about your gadgets more than anything. And of course, I would love to photograph waterfalls, but they're kind of hard to find in Florida where we're at sea level. <laughs> <laughs> so I may take you up on uh, coming to visit. Anyway, I hope that you got a lot out of that talk, that interview. And remember, everything will be in the show notes. Subscribe to either our YouTube channel, our podcast, or like us on Facebook. I'm Peggy Farron. Thanks for joining us on the Understand Photography Show. We'll talk to you next week. Get up!